two years comes out as an acorn. After two years comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. A lot of people think weevils have uh, big noses because uh, it does, it looks like they do, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule and the mouth parts are way down at the end of that extension, way down here. They take those mouth parts and chew a hole into the center of the acorn, turn around and lay an egg in it. And that's how the, the uh, weevil larva gets into the acorn. You might wonder why they spend two years uh, underground. Why don't they come out next year the way most insects do? And the answer is that it, it takes red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if uh, the weevils came out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. After the weevil leaves the acorn, it leaves a hole, a true vacuum in the acorn. And you know that nature abhors a vacuum. In this case, she has filled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants where the entire colony lives in the holes made by acorn weevils after they leave the acorn. And if scouts find a new acorn with a new hole, they get very excited because their old home is falling apart. So they tell everybody it's time to move. They grab the larvae, they grab the eggs, they move the entire colony into the new acorn in about 30 minutes. Then they post a guard here, make sure nobody else comes in. And that's where they'll live for the next two years until this acorn falls apart. What's my point? Uh, very simply, that that is just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions between animals and plants that comprise the bulk of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and oaks. Jays are the primary disperser of oak acorns. They'll take an acorn from the, from the tree and fly up to a mile from the parent tree. And then they tap it below the, the surface of the soil. And the idea is they're going to go and get that acorn and have something to eat during the wintertime. Uh, but they only remember where one out of every four acorns they bury actually is. So uh, they, in effect, plant for every four acorns they bury, they plant three new, acorn, new oak trees. And in a mass year, they can bury 4,500 acorns. So they're planting thousands of, of trees, every single jay that is out there. Another specialized interaction between pileated woodpeckers and uh, carpenter ants, that is what they rear their young on. So you won't have uh, you won't have pileated woodpeckers unless you have lots of carpenter ants, and you won't have lots of carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena faciliae, unless you have that plant, facilia. That is the only pollen that that bee can rear its young on. And pollen specialization is very common in our native bees, and we have about 4,000 species of native bees. Without the proper plant, those bees cannot reproduce. You won't have the Baltimore checker spot without white turtle head. I could spend all night talking about nature specialized relationships. Uh, but my point tonight is that those relationships, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, uh, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, looked out over the edge and said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, we can't leave it as it was because, at least now we can't, because we didn't. Um, only about 5% of the U.S., the lower 48 states, is anything close to its original pristine ecological state. And that is because we have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it. We have drained it. We have grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland, and that is four and a half times the size of Texas. And of course, we paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them, and you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated to sustain the amount of nature that we need to run the ecosystems that we all depend on. You might wonder why we've done this. I wonder why we've done this. Uh, I don't know, but I, I suspect we think, we thought that the earth, our nest was so big that we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences to that. But of course we were wrong. And that's why we're seeing pretty scary headlines like this. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one, North America's lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. That's almost a third of our, our breeding bird population already gone. And now the UN says, well, we're gonna lose a million species to extinction probably in the next 20 years. You know, I heard a, a statistic on NPR the other day that um, 
I guess two days ago, they removed 14 species from the endangered species list. And they removed them because they're already extinct. So maybe this is a, an accurate prediction, but uh, I'll tell you, we can't afford uh, for this to come true. You might as well say we're going to lose oxygen in the next 20 years uh, because it's not an option to lose oxygen or a million species. We have to make sure that doesn't happen. So I can go on talking about the, the pox that we humans have, have delivered upon the environment and thus upon all of our houses, but that is not what this talks about. This talks about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from a lot of people, but those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return to this uh, headline briefly. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, once again, E.O. Wilson told us what it would mean if we were to lose insects on planet Earth. And he did it in this paper way back in 1987 called The Little Things That Run the World. His message was very simple. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, that would uh, so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems that the food webs that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, even many of our freshwater fishes, those food webs would collapse and those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients. And all we would have is, is uh, bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. There is some good news here, uh, folks, and that is that none of this has to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're gonna to have to change the way we landscape to do it, and we're gonna to have to change the way we landscape soon. Why is that? Well, humans are, remember, humans are products of nature. They are totally dependent on the life support systems that healthy ecosystems deliver. I always say they deliver them for us. They deliver them for everything that's living on the planet, like the production of oxygen. That's what plants are, are, are giving us. Clean water, clean air water slowing its journey to the sea where it's too salty to use. Plants are, are capturing carbon, pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, out of harm's way, pumping it into the ground through their root systems and building their tissues out of that carbon. Plants are building topsoil, holding it in place. They're preventing floods, dampening severe weather, converting sunlight into food. You know, without plants, we'd have to eat sunlight and that will be hard. What are animals doing for, for plants? Well, they're providing pest control services. They're pollinating nearly 90% of our flowering plants, dispersing plant seeds. So designing landscapes like this that destroys the production of ecosystem services is just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but today it's actually a terrible idea because we've got 7.8, 7.9 billion people on the planet. We need more ecosystem services today than ever before. There have been visionaries through the ages uh, who have recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with planet Earth. And Elder Leopold was one of the most eloquent, he wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. One of the things he said is that, that the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. Now there have been indigenous groups that have been able to do that for long periods, but our large Western societies and our large Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the earth than it has to offer, completely wrecking an area, then going to another area doing the same thing, not sustainable behavior. Uh, well, Aldo Leopold had a lot of faith in, in human beings. Uh, he believed we could develop what he called a land ethic. He knew we had to use the land, we had, to, we had to farm and lumber and graze and mine and do all of those things. Uh, but he believed we could learn to do them gently enough that we did not destroy local ecosystems. And that's what he called the land ethic, wrote about it in the, in the Sand County Almanac. What he didn't write about was developing a land ethic where we actually lived. Uh, and I'm not sure why that, that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and, and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time that notion was so deeply embedded in the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, it's still embedded in our own culture, that he may not have recognized it as an option. But not only, uh, what I want to talk about tonight is that not only is living with nature an option, it is now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head. We need to save nature, actually reconstruct it, where there are a lot of people, because that's pretty much everywhere. 
In other words, we have to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes, not hang on by a thread, not get diminished every single year, but thrive. Where are we gonna do that? Well, let's go back to private property. 85.6% um, of the US east of the Mississippi is privately owned. 90, what is it? 98% of Texas is privately owned. 78% of the entire country is privately owned. If we don't do conservation on private property, we're gonna fail because we'll be working in areas that are too small, too few and too isolated to sustain the amount of nature that we need to run our ecosystems. Now, when I talk about, about um, conservation, I'm, I'm not really using the, the word correctly. I'm not talking about conserving the areas we haven't wrecked yet. Yes, we have to do that. A lot of people working on doing that. I'm talking about rebuilding the areas that we have already wrecked. Uh, and I know they won't be exactly like they were before we, we dismantled the natural systems, but we can reunite enough of those specialized interactions so that we will have ecosystem function again, even if it doesn't look exactly like it used to look. And in order to do that, we have to start with the most powerful species. Not all species contribute to ecosystem function equally. So we have to start with the species uh, that, that uh, are the building blocks that everything else depends on. And there are two groups that we can't do without. One of them is the flowering plants and the pollinators that allow them to reproduce. They, of course, are capturing the energy from the sun and turning it into to food, which they store in their tissues, mostly their leaves. So now we have uh, energy in, in the form of food and plant leaves. We're not going to have any animals unless we get that energy to animals. And most vertebrates do not eat plants directly. They eat the invertebrates that ate plants. And most of those invertebrates, of course, are insects, but not just any old insects. It turns out that caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars, we're going to have failed food webs and failed ecosystems. Let me use the Carolina chickadee as an example. Uh, they, of course, are they're the birds that are, are feeders all winter long, eating seeds. And, and so naturally, we think that's what they need. Well, 50% of their diet in the wintertime is, is seed. But the other 50% is insects and spiders. And when they reproduce, 100% is, is insects and spiders, primarily caterpillars. If they're in a healthy environment, they will feed their young almost exclusively on caterpillars. And it turns out that they are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds are rearing their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? Well, there's a, a number of lines of evidence that suggest that, but this is a citizen science project that one of my uh, students did a few years ago, Ashley Kennedy. She put out a call to bird photographers across the country to take pictures of birds during the breeding season and then send those, those pictures to Ashley. She was gonna identify the prey items that were in the beaks as they were taking food to the nest uh, with the idea of reconstructing the nestling diet for as many species of birds in North America as she could, she could do. She got thousands of pictures, identified lots of prey items. Uh, and you're looking at the summary of her results. The green bars are the percentage of uh, nestling diets in 20 common bird families uh, that were caterpillars. And in 16 out of those 20 common bird families, caterpillars dominated the diet. So again, what would happen to our breeding birds? What would happen to breeding success if we didn't design landscapes that had lots of caterpillars? Most of our birds would not be able to breed. So something special about caterpillars, what is it? There's actually several things special about caterpillars. And one of them is they're soft. So think of this guy as if he's a, a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is his exoskeleton. It's, it's cuticle. It's made of, of chitin, which is undigestible. And because the caterpillar is soft, the bird can stuff it down the throat of its babies without fear of injuring them. And if you've ever watched a parent bird rear their young, they're pretty rough. They take that beak and stuff it down there. It's like a plunger. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. And many of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or, or get one caterpillar? They're nutritious. They're high in fat, high in protein, low percentage of chitin of exoskeleton compared to many other types of insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little, little uh, sausages. They're like little tanks. So much of a beetle is undigestible. And many beetle, beetles have uh, very sharp edges. And finally, it turns out the caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate and birds are vertebrates and we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. 
only plants make carotenoids. So we have to get our carotenoids from plants and we have to get them from plants because they are essential components of vertebrate diets. And that's why my wife, Cindy, makes sure I have a lot of carrots to get my beta carotene and a lot of tomatoes to get my lycopene, a lot of whatever that is to get my lutein. And when I eat those things, they stimulate my immune system. I can't think of a better time to have a very strong immune system. They're antioxidants. They run around our bodies, protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve vertebrate color vision. When your mother said, uh, eat your carrots, you will see better, she was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. They improve sperm vitality, improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about things like this profanitary warbler who is bright yellow because he's had access to lots of lutein's. He takes those lutein's, makes pigments out of them, puts them in his feathers, and the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. But where's he getting his, his carotenoids from? He's getting them from, of course, the prey items that he eats, but carotenoid levels are not equal across different uh, invertebrate prey items. So these are first two bars here are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other, other prey. Here are the adult caterpillars down here, the moths and butterflies themselves. Again, fewer carotenoids because they're not eating the green leaves. It's the caterpillars eating the green leaves where the carotenoids are. And here's the, uh, here's the earthworm way down here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. So that study and several others are suggesting that caterpillars are not optional parts of bird diets. They are essential parts of bird diets. So let's just say birds need caterpillars. The next question is, how many do they need? Is one or two enough? One or two a day enough? Well, let's go back to chickadees um, and ask the question, how many caterpillars does it take to make a clutch of chickadees? One or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands of caterpillars, depending on the, the number of chicks in the nest, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars, just to get them to the point where they fledge, where they leave the nest. And after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars as they fly all around for 21 days. But we can't count those because they are flying all around. But you're talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to make one clutch of a bird that's a third of an ounce. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, and I would think you do because in so many places that's all we have left is our yards, you have to have all those caterpillars in, in your yard. And if you don't landscape in a way that has all those caterpillars, that's called insect decline. The reason you have to have them in your yard is because the chickadees only forage about, about 50 meters from the nest. They are not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. So if we don't landscape in a way that makes all those caterpillars, that's insect decline. And it really looks like insect decline is one of the major drivers of the bird declines that people are measuring. We went to the original data set of Rosenberg et al. The, uh, that's the group, the Smithsonian group that said we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided the terrestrial birds up into two groups, the ones that require insects at some part of their life history, typically when they're breeding, and the ones that don't. So things like doves and finches can reproduce on seeds. They don't need insects. And they didn't lose any numbers in the last 50 years. But the birds that require insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species over the last 50 years. This doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly is suggestive that as you take away bird food, the birds disappear. So let's just say uh, we need a lot of caterpillars if we want birds. Birds are just an example of the things that are eating those, those caterpillars. And we need to, we need to change our goals of, for, for landscaping. You know, in the past, uh, we have thought that, that humans are here and nature someplace else, and we could design our landscapes any, any way we wanted because they did not have to be ecologically functional. Well, there is no someplace else anymore for nature. So now we, now we need to learn how to live together. And that means we need to landscape in a way that supports our local food webs. In other words, we have to landscape in a way that makes caterpillars. How do we do that? We add caterpillars to landscapes by adding the plants that, that support them, that make them. And that seems easy enough, but there is a catch. And that is that most plants don't support a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about it. We have to add the plants that do support a lot of caterpillars. And we have to be fussy about it because the caterpillars themselves are fussy about it. And the monarch butterfly, of course, is a, a, a perfect example. Uh, we all know that monarchs are specialists on milkweeds. You can have all the crepe myrtles and all the camellias and all the Bradford pears and all of the boxwoods and all of the hostas and all of the plants from Asia that we love to landscape with, and you won't make a single monarch butterfly. You have to have milkweeds. That's called host plant specialization, and it turns out most of the insects that eat plants are 
host plant specialists. Why? Because plants have made them that way. Plants that want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their tissues with nasty tasting chemicals, second, secondary metabolic compounds that make those, those tissues either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. Uh, and, and that's why it's green out there in the summertime, not because there are no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. They can only eat particular plant lineages. And every plant lineage that's out there protects itself with a unique cocktail of chemical defenses. And an insect cannot adapt to all of those types of defenses. So they pick one or two uh, plant lineages that are really similar in how they're protecting themselves. And they get good at getting around those particular defenses. They, they uh, develop enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize the insect's exposure to those compounds. But it takes a long period of, of history with those particular plant lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. And once they do, the insect is locked into eating that particular plant. And that's why when we take away our, our milkweeds and replace them with hostas or anything else, we lose the monarch. It doesn't start to eat whatever we replaced it with. It can't. It can only eat milkweeds. And it's also why when we bring in plants from other continents and when they escape and become invasive species, we're just devastating our local food webs because most of our native insects cannot eat those plants. So all I'm saying here is that plant choice matters. If we're trying to rebuild food webs, we have to be very careful about which plants we put in our yards, in our landscapes, or it's not going to work. And I'm going to give you three examples of how well it does work uh, when we, we are thoughtful about our plant choice. So I'm going to start with our house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. Uh, we, we bought a piece of a farm that was broken up, a uh, very old farm, been farmed for 300 years or so. Uh, and the last thing they did before they, they uh, broke up the farm was to mow it for hay. So, I mean, there really were very few, few plants there. And our goal was to rebuild the food web on, on this land. Uh, to recreate some of the, the biodiversity that used to be there. And you're not going to do that without bringing the caterpillars back. So here are some ways that, that I did that. Um, in the beginning, I wanted to see if I could, I could attract the Canadian owlet. I'd never seen a Canadian owlet before, but I knew they used to occur here. That's what one looks like. That's what the adult looks like, just like a, a leaf. And in order to have Canadian owlets, you have to have their host plant. You have to have meadow rue. We didn't have any meadow rue. Uh, it should be growing here, but this area was farmed to death for 300 years. No meadow root anywhere around here. So I got some seeds from someplace and planted it and grew very nicely. Uh, but I, you know, I didn't have a whole lot of faith that, that Canadian outlets would be able to find my little patch of meadow root. So I didn't even go out and check it for uh, oh, almost two months after I planted it. And when I did, turned out it was covered with, with Canadian outlets. So it, it, they had come right away. It was a huge success. Uh, and I'm still surprised about that, but now I've got a good population of Canadian outlets and meadow roo. So we've added two species to the property. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. This beautiful moth, that's actually a myth, misnomer. Uh, they don't have anything to do with goldenrod. They're a specialist on this plant, Biden's aristosa. I did know where there was some Biden's aristosa, they call it ditch daisy, uh, in a power line cut about 14 miles away. So I, I got uh, some seeds, planted them at home. They grew very nicely. Well, it took a year for the uh, goldenrod stowaway to find my Bidens, but then they did. Uh, I went out the other, the other night with a flashlight. There were 15 goldenrod stowaways on my little patch of, of Bidens. So another big success. Um, now we've added four species to the property. Same story with the hackberry emperor. I wanted the hackberry emperor, not because it's the most beautiful butterfly in the world, but because it belongs here. And as its name suggests, it's a specialist on hackberry. And we didn't have any hackberry. We didn't have any celtis, so I planted it. it took four years for the butterfly to find my, my celtis, but I finally did. I checked one of my, my hackberry branches in June. There were nine hackberry emperor caterpillars on a single branch. So now we've added six species, and that's how it went. I did not plant goldenrod, came in on its own. 
And along with it came things that depend on goldenrod, like the beautiful brown hooded owlet, the Arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparagonothus, the goldenrod gall moth. This is when it hasn't come, the goldenrod flower moth. Um, I don't know why it hasn't come. That's what its caterpillars look like. Uh, but this is, this is part of the fun. Um, this is anticipation. It's like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Uh, I go out every year, right about now, looking for the goldenrod flower moth. One of these years, I'm going to find it, and that will be a great day. Planted Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. I, I, I have heard that uh, some people don't like Virginia creeper. I just don't know why. It's a great native plant. It can climb our trees without girdling them. It's a good ground cover. It's got good fall color. It makes uh, very nutritious berries for the birds in the fall, and it's a great pollinator plant, believe it or not. Its flowers are small and inconspicuous, but the native bees love it. Remember, when you're making a pollinator garden, you're making it for the bees, not for you. Uh, so whether they're inconspicuous or not does not matter. And it turns out that, that Virginia creeper is the best host plant for the large sphinx moths that uh, particularly our cardinals love to feed their young. Like the Pandora sphinx and its beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. I want to see if I can get the double tooth prominent at our house, um, just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. Even if you don't like caterpillars, you got to love this guy. Well, it's a specialist on elm, particularly American elm, and we didn't have any American elm. Died out with the uh, Dutch elm disease years ago, but there are two big American elms at the University of Delaware that did not die. And every year they make seeds. I got some seeds uh, right after we moved in, planted them and they grew very nicely. Right now, those trees are, are at least 80 feet tall, and they're supporting the double tooth prominent. Caterpillar came right away. American elm. Want to see if I get the evening primrose moth, because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. Well, we didn't have any evening primrose, believe it or not, so uh, I planted it. Moths came. This is how they spend the day with their heads stuffed in the flowers. It's very cute. And I planted lots of oaks. Now, these are just examples of the plant lineages I put back on the property, but I want to focus on oaks for a while because they are such important plants. This is the Bedford oak in Bedford, New York. Uh, and it's people argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. It's enormous. And you know, I hear people say that that's actually a, a, a downside for them. They say, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if you can only enjoy your oak when it's 400 years old, you're right, you won't. But if you can enjoy what your oak is doing on your landscape, uh, first of all, they grow a lot faster than you think, but you can enjoy them immediately. And I can say that with confidence because I planted my oaks, most of my oaks as acorns, which means they were free, or two foot bare root whips, which means they cost $1.50 each. And immediately they started to rebuild the food web that supports the, the birds and everything else at our house by bringing in things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, uh, Suzuki's promolactus, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the orange patch smoky wing, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laffer, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the oaks on our property and they come right away. This is a pin oak that has just popped its head above the leaves and here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves at that tree. So you don't have to wait generations before the, uh, the oaks in your property start to support your local, local wildlife. And that's really what it's all about. They do it right away. This is what our house looks like today. Um, I show you this because I want you to see my lawn. We're very traditional here, but we put a lot of, of plants back. That's really the point. And four years ago, I decided to uh, take on a big project. And that was to try to get a picture of every species of moth that is now living on our property. I'm still at it, but oh, I'm behind here. I'm up to 1,137 moth species uh, on our property. Uh, and we've got 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So on one 240 thousandths of the land mass, we have 44% of all the moss species that occur in the entire state. And because so many of these species are types of bird food, uh, we 
have uh, recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres, not flew by, but bred. Why am I telling you this? Well, this is another headline that we saw last year. The World Wildlife Fund says that uh, we have lost two thirds of the wildlife uh, on planet Earth since 1970. Pretty depressing statistic, but I'm thinking not at our house. I am convinced we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds and it didn't take that long. And we did it by simply putting the plants back. So it's a, it's a very powerful uh, uh, conservation of, approach that each one of us can practice. Don't get discouraged and, and, and uh, upset about these, these headlines. Get angry, decide to do something about it. We can put the plants back and we can stop these, these needless losses. But I know what you're thinking. We've got 10 acres. A lot of people in suburbia don't have that much land. Will it work on smaller lots? And that is a good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpster's house in Kirkwood, Missouri, where they have 0.6 acres. That's 18 times less land than Cindy and I have. Well, when they moved in, their, their property was choked with bush honeysuckle, armor honeysuckle from, from Asia, invasive plant. So they got rid of that. They put in a lot of species of native plants, including a uh, water feature for the birds that they call a bubbler. Uh, and then they started to count the birds that are using their, their yard. They're up to 149 bird species, including 35 warbler species. If you know anything about birds, that's a good number. Just to compare that to, to our house, we've only recorded eight warbler species at our house. Then they did it on 0.6 acres. So does it work on smaller properties? Absolutely. What about urban yards though? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, because on the other side of this wall here is um, one of the runways of O'Hare Airport. Over here is a, a Kennedy Expressway. Pam has one tenth of an acre and it's not connected to any natural area at all. So she's a little island. Ten, one tenth of an acre, by the way, is three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. She's a pretty island, but she did the same thing. She uh, got rid of her invasive plants, put in 60 species of native plants, including a water feature for, for the birds. And then she started to count her, her birds that are using her one-tenth of an acre. And she's up to 120 species of birds, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. If you haven't seen a, a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house in Chicago. There are four things uh, we need to think about if we're going to succeed in a big way. And one of them has got to be, we've got to shrink the area that we have in lawn. <clears throat> that's because we have too much lawn. We got over 40 million acres of lawn and that's a, that's a 2005 statistic. That's an area the size of New England, which is dedicated to an ecological deadscape. Uh, so I know we, ha we have lawn, uh, it's, you know, it's a status symbol. Um, it's part of our culture. Uh, and I'm not suggesting we get rid of it. I'm suggesting we cut that area in half. The area of lawn we keep, we can still manicure, we can still be good citizens, our neighbors will still love us, but let's put plants in the other side. And if we replant half the area that's now in lawn, that'll give us 20 million acres that we can use for conservation. We can create a new national park that if we do it at home, I'm calling it homegrown national park. And it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. You add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. We'll have the biggest uh, national park in the country. What are the benefits of, of putting some part of nature right where you live? Well, one of the primary benefits is you get to develop a personal relationship with, with that part of nature, and you can do it uh, just you know, at your own time, your own pace, by looking out your window or simply going outside. You can avoid crowds. You know, if you go to a real national park, there are millions of people there. 375 million people went to our national parks last year. It was a parking lot. It's also free. There's no admission fee. It's never closed, no matter what pandemic comes down the, the pike, or no matter how many times the government shuts down its funding or whatever they're about to do. Um, no travel hassles. You get to experience the natural world alone, which I think is critical. I don't know how you can develop a personal relationship with the natural world if it's mediated by, by somebody else. And this is particularly important for our kids. Our poor kids are suffering from nature deficit disorder. So we're trying, we get 30 kids, put them on a bus with, with a, a teacher and they drive for an hour, go to some natural area, walk around for an hour and the teacher tells them not to touch anything. And they get back on the bus and they go home. 
and that's their exposure to the natural world, which I'm sure is better than nothing. But it's really been exposure to 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have some part of the natural world where they live, all they have to do is go out and interact with it alone, no parental supervision. Let them develop that personal relationship, which is, which is critically important because our kids are the future stewards of the planet. And if they don't have a personal relationship with what they're stewarding, if they don't love what they're stewarding, if they don't know how to steward it, if they don't know why they're supposed to steward it, they're going to be lousy stewards. And we can't afford any more lousy stewardship. And maybe they will learn how to hunt lizards. I am learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe who lives in Hawaii on a very, very modest piece of, of nature. It's a little patch of lawn with a hedge, but there are anole lizards there. And she sent me this picture to describe how you hunt lizards. You get in the ground and you cover yourself with leaves and sticks. So the lizards don't see you coming. Then you crawl very slowly toward the lizard. No smiling, this is serious business here. You can wear your best dress, that's okay. But you, you sneak up on the lizard, you catch the lizard, you put it in an aquarium, you learn how to take care of it. You learn how to be a good steward of that piece of nature and you develop that personal relationship with that lizard, with nature. I don't think Zoe's gonna, gonna uh, be catching lizards on the ground in her best dress the rest of her life. I don't think. She sent me this picture the other day, so who knows? But I guarantee she's gonna remember catching lizards in Hawaii the rest of her life. And I also guarantee she's gonna be a good steward of the planet in part because of that experience. If you want your kids to, to do more than catch lizards, get Nancy Stranisti's Nature Play at Home. Dozens of examples of how to expose your kids to nature right where they live. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, uh, that you go to our new website, homegrownnationalpark.org, uh, and get yourself on the map. It's free. There's no admission fee here. Um, no, we're not going to use your data. But what you do is you, you uh, put in the uh, location where you are, and the amount of area, the amount of lawn you're gonna convert or the amount of lawn you already have converted or the woodlot that you're saving, the, the part of nature that you are conserving, uh, the area, and, and then you your little piece of your county will, will light up. You will get to see all the other people in your county that are, are have joined Homegrown National Park. The object is of course to build our 20 million acre national park by all getting together, uh, you know, we're a tribal species and we're all gonna join the conservation tribe here. It's gonna, we're gonna use social media to motivate people who don't realize that their piece of the earth is a very important part of, of conservation. And we can watch the, the um, success build as, as people light up on, on the map. Uh, it's young, this is young, it's less than a year old. We've got almost 11,000 members of, of Homegrown National Park, but um, we need at least 11 million. So encourage your neighbors to, to get on the map. All right, we're gonna shrink the lawn. What plants should we put in the area where we're gonna remove lawn? Uh, some of them, I'm gonna argue, need to be what I call keystone plants. Remember what a keystone is. This is the Roman arch. The keystone is the stone in the middle of the arch. And if you take it out of the arch, the arch falls down. Well, I call these keystone plants because if you take them out of the local food web, uh, the food web collapses. And that's because they're making most of the food. Just 5% of our native plants are making 75% of that caterpillar food that drives the food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So think of the, the uh, keystone plants and the ecological house that you're building as the two by fours that are, are holding up that house. They're essential. You can't build a house out of wallpaper, but you're not finished building your house uh, when you have the keystone plants. They're just something you have to absolutely include. So the question is no longer simply are, are natives better than, than non-natives. On average, they certainly are, but there's a lot of natives that aren't contributing all that much uh, either. So the question really is, do we want to put the most productive native plants into our yards that are supporting the most pollinators and the most caterpillars or not? I get an email uh, once in a while from somebody saying, don't you know that ginkgo, ginkgo biloba from Asia used to grow in North America 7 million years ago. That makes them native. That means we can plant them and everything will be great. Yes, I do know that ginkgos grew in North America 7 million years ago. We can argue about whether that makes them native today, but I'm not gonna have that argument because um, that's not the metric that we're using anymore. It's not whether they're native or not, it's whether they're doing anything or not. 
I don't care if ginkgos grew in the moon 7 million years ago, they produce zero species of caterpillar. They do not support the local food web. So they're taking up space without contributing. What's supporting the local food web more than anything else? Uh, well, in 84% of the counties in which they occur, it is oaks. It is one of the oaks, the genus Quercus. In the mid-Atlantic states, they support 557 species of caterpillars, over 950 species nationwide. There is no other plant genus that comes close to that. How do you find out what the keystone uh, plants are where you live? You go to Native Plant Finder in the National Wildlife Federation website and you put in your zip code and the ranked list of both the uh, woody and herbaceous plants for your county will pop up. Uh, and this is what a typical list for uh, uh, where are you, Southeast uh, Texas would look like. Notice I say native oaks, native cherries, native willows, hickories. If I go to the nursery and, and uh, say, I want to buy a cherry. They're going to sell me an ornamental cherry from, from Asia. If I say, I want to buy a willow, they will sell me a weeping willow from Turkey, because those are the plants that are in the trade. You have to specify that you want a native member of, your, of these very powerful genera, because if you don't, if you get a non-native member, even though uh, they're closely related to our natives, they will reduce caterpillar use by 68%. We have, we have measured that. These are the uh, top ranked herbaceous plants. Golden rods are always way up there. The various genera that asters were broken up into are there. Sunflowers, very high, not only in terms of, of producing caterpillars. Golden rods, by the way, support 110 species of caterpillars, but also in terms of supporting the specialist bees. When you're building a pollinator garden, you want to build one for specialist bees because the generalists can use those plants as well. If you only build one for, for generalist bees, so things that honeybees and bumblebees use, you've lost all your specialists that won't be able to reproduce there. With just these three genera here, uh, you can have at least 44 species of, of specialist bees in your yard. And if you don't have those three genera, you, you won't have them at all. So we're going to shrink the lawn. We're gonna put in keystone plants uh, and invite a lot of insects to our, our yard. And then we're gonna kill them with our security light which of course is not the goal. Uh, there's a lot of research uh, coming online now that, that uh, tells us insect or, or light pollution at night is one of the major causes of insect decline, both here and in Europe. And these are all the ways that lights uh, kill our insects. But to me, this is good news because we have to reverse insect decline. We've already lost 45% of the insects on, on planet Earth. And remember, they're the things keeping us, keeping us alive here. Uh, so we've got to turn that around. We've got to rebuild those insect populations. And if we can do that by simply flicking a switch, by turning our lights out at night, we're getting off easy. That's easy to do. But I know what you're going to say. Uh, I cannot uh, turn the light off over my garage or my front porch because the bad man will come. Okay, put a motion sensor on it. So it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're gonna notice is the bad man doesn't come very often. And if you don't wanna do that, take the, the white light, the white bulb out of your security light and put in a yellow bulb, a yellow LED bulb is, is the best because yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to uh, nocturnal insects than our white wavelengths. If we replaced our, our white security bulbs with yellow bulbs overnight, we could uh, save billions of insects and probably billions of dollars too because those bulbs are a lot more energy efficient. Okay, we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put in, in uh, keystone plants. We're gonna turn out our lights. Then we're gonna invite Mosquito Joe to come kill all of our, our insects. Uh, seems to be no, no shortage of ways to kill all of our insects. This is a booming business uh, all around the country, not just in, in the, the South. Uh, and Mosquito Joe will say, well, it's okay because uh, this fog here is a natural product. And he's right. It's made, it's pyrethroids. It's made from uh, chrysanthemums. But cyanide is also a natural product. So I'm not sure that's a good argument. Uh, he'll also say it only kills mosquitoes. And that's not even close to, to true. I don't you, you probably remember the headlines last year, right about this time, where uh, there were huge monarch kills uh, when they flew through Mosquito Joe's fog here, hundreds of monarchs dead on the ground. This kills all the insects it comes in contact with. But th the big thing is it does not control mosquitoes, which is why he has to keep coming back and charging you lots of money. In order to control mosquitoes in the adult stage, you have to kill 90% of those mosquitoes. Uh, and Mosquito Joe kills between 10 and 50% on a good day. Uh, 
so he doesn't come close to controlling the mosquitoes. If you really want to control mosquitoes, you attempt to do it in the larval stage. And homeowners can do it this way. You, you get a bucket. Uh, people say, how big a bucket? I don't care. Bigger the better. Get a bucket, fill it full of water, put in a handful of straw or hay, uh, and let it ferment for a couple of days. Uh, what you're doing is building up the the uh, population of diatoms and algae, and that's what mosquito larvae eat. And that brew becomes irresistible to any female mosquito in your yard who wants to lay her eggs. She will lay them in your bucket. Then you put in a mosquito dunk. You go to the harbor store, you can get this, get mosquito dunks for $9, put in a mosquito dunk. This is Bacillus thuringiensis. It is a uh, natural uh, bacterium that kills aquatic dipterin. And the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket is mosquito larvae. So they will, they will nibble on it and they will die. If a uh, dragonfly gets in here, it's not gonna hurt them. If your dog licks it or, or uh, a bird drinks it, it's not gonna hurt them at all. You might put a screen over it, uh, you know, um, fairly coarse screen so that uh, chipmunks and things don't fall in there. But otherwise it's a great way, a very targeted way to kill the mosquitoes locally. And if everybody did it, we really take a chunk out of those mosquito populations. Um, the fourth thing we need to do in order to uh, increase the caterpillar populations in our, our, uh, our landscapes is to allow those caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? Well, I live in, in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the tree, or eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon and hangs from one of the branches, uh, and then it emerges as an adult, and then it does it all again. I wish everything did that, but most species don't do that. They finish growing as caterpillars on the tree, and then they drop from the tree. About 94% of them drop from the tree, wiggle their way beneath the soil surface to pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. Uh, and that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. And we mow and compact our soil around our trees so that it's rock hard and the caterpillars can't get underground. So the way we landscape pretty much everywhere becomes an ecological trap. Any moth that comes in and lays its eggs on those trees will, will uh, the caterpillar hatch and, and grow and then drop down and die. And the next generation will be small and the next generation after that is gone. I am convinced that this is one of the, another major cause of insect declines but it's another one that's easily reversed. And of course the cement landscape is not gonna do it. This is what most people do. They put a tree in, in a yard and we're just starting to measure how well caterpillars do in a situation like this. But I guarantee they will do better in a situation like this where you have a layered landscape. You've got a tree and then maybe a dogwood and a native azalea, and ferns, ground cover. This is a safe site. The caterpillar drops down, can easily get beneath the, the soil surface because it's not compacted. Nobody's gonna mow it, nobody's gonna step on it. Plenty of leaf litter in there for them to, to spin their cocoon in. Survivorship will be much higher. This is where you can do your fancy spring ephemeral gardening. This is how you shrink the lawn. You put beds around your trees. That's a great way to shrink the area you have in lawn. These become safe sites. This is where you can use your, your uh, ground covers, things like um, wild ginger or may apple or foam flower or ferns. This is a, a uh, hotel in Athens, Georgia. These are red maple trees. Any caterpillar developing on these can drop down to a safe site, complete its development, even though it's the middle of the city. So we can do a whole lot better with how we landscape under our trees. Another uh, student, Desiree Narango, has done some wonderful work with, with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, DC. And her results suggest that there's actually room for compromise in our plant choices, and that's, that's good news. What she did was ask the question, how well do landscapes, suburban landscapes that are uh, dominated by native plants, none of them had 100% native plants, but dominated by native plants, how do that well do they sustain chickadee, landscape, uh, chickadee populations compared to landscapes dominated by typical introduced plants from Asia? Well, first thing she found is that those, those uh, landscapes dominated by introduced plants produce 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, you reduce the amount of bird food by 75%. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. Uh, so there were nest boxes up in every, every yard, but the chickadees would come and look around and say, well, there's not enough food here. We're not even gonna try to reproduce. If they did try to reproduce, those nests contained 1.5 fewer eggs. The clutches were 29% less likely to survive at all. 
If they did survive, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings and it took them 1.5 days longer to reach maturity. And if you put all that into a population growth model as a function of the percentage of non-native woody plant biomass in your yard from none to 100%, this is what you get. The dotted line is replacement rate. That's the rate at which the population has to make babies in order to replace the adults that, that uh, die every year. Chickadees don't live that long. If you reproduce at that uh, rate, you've got a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, you've got a growing population. But if you make fewer babies, you've got a shrinking, unsustainable population. Right here is where those lines overlap, uh, which is the area of compromise, uh, which suggests that, that uh, you can have up to 30%, generously speaking, 30% of your, your woody plant biomass non-native without, um, and you can still have a, a uh, sustainable chickadee population. And that this is gonna apply to other birds as well. As long as 70% of the, the woody plants in your yard are productive natives. So this is, uh, this is the area of compromise that I'm excited about because if my message was you can't have any non-natives, uh, very few people would be, be listening because we love our, our non-native plants. And remember, it's not the presence of those non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence of the native plants that those food webs depend on. So if we get these plants back into our landscapes, we can have some of these and it'll be okay. Can we use native plants in formal designs? Of course we can. This is a design from uh, Lynn O'Shaughnessy. You don't get more formal than that. Uh, and every plant in that landscape is a native plant. This was taken by a drone 400 feet up. So that's a sizable garden. Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe all the time. And I guess that's okay because they're non-native plants over there. Can we get a, a pollinator garden into a typical suburban yard like this without offending anybody? Of course we can, just put a little fence around it. It formalizes it. It tells people it's, it's not a place where we just missed with the mower. It's beautiful. It supports several species of bees. It's not very big. It could be bigger, uh, but uh, if everybody did it, it would, it would certainly help. And remember why we need pollinators. The media, everybody says we need pollinators because they pollinate our crops. But then people say, well, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. Yes, you do. We need pollinators really because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet, and that is not an option. Where do we need these plants? Everywhere we need. I mean, where do we need these pollinators? Everywhere we need plants, which is everywhere. How about this design? It's a, it's a Drew Latham design. It's much bigger. Uh, imagine the amount of life that's supported here versus the amount of life that's supported here. Seems like a no-brainer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Of course they can, and more and more of them are doing it. Minnesota uh, was one of the first to institute a cost-sharing program uh, that helps, it, it pays homeowners to reduce or, or completely replace their lawn with appropriate Minnesota prairie plants. It's called the Lawn to Legume Program very popular. Pennsylvania started a new lawn conversion program. Get up to $5,000 per acre of lawn that you convert to, to native plantings. Again, very popular. This was designed to help watersheds. Uh, but of course, if you use the right plants, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help biodiversity a lot. There's an island off Florida where they're paying residents to allow uh, burrowing owls, listed species, to burrow in the front yard. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written, with carrots rather than sticks. If you have an endangered species on your property, we're going to pay you to be a good steward of that species. We're not going to fine you if you do something with your property. Everybody would want an endangered species. Missouri, uh, uh, St. Louis, Missouri, and Fayetteville, Arkansas have a, a uh, bounty on calorie pears. You take out the calorie pear and you get a free tree replacement. And even uh, water utilities, San Antonio Water Systems, paying, giving people $100 coupons to put in water efficient native plants rather than the, the thirsty uh, non natives that uh, we just can't afford anymore. And of course, the great lawn conversion programs in the far west, particularly California. $2 per square foot rebate for every uh, area of lawn, every square foot of lawn you take out and put in appropriate xeric plantings. They don't have any water for, for, for grass, believe me. Okay, I think we made three missteps in the early years of, of conservation. 
The first one's a serious one. We've come to think of nature as optional. It doesn't mean we don't like it. We like it. Uh, but you know, if it's optional, if it's not essential, when push comes to shove, when resources are in short supply, which is always, nature will take a back seat. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the, uh, the virus broke out, and there was this wall-sized poster there that, that to me epitomizes our society's view of, of nature or of conservation. We wanna save nature, save wildlife, so that future generations can enjoy them. This was, this was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for creating the national park system. These are wonderful places we wanna save them so future generations can appreciate them. And I get that. Uh, they are uh, enormously entertaining. But nature is far more than, than there for entertainment. We've got to save nature so that we have future generations. It's a little bit more urgent. Uh, we've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. And we talked about this, but if we restrict conservation only to the areas where, where there aren't a lot of humans, we're going to fail. Because again, those areas are, are too small and too isolated. David Quammen has an excellent analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a functional Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And this is what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. But I hate that terminology because it suggests they're places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, including our roadsides, even including much of our, our agriculture. So we need, to, we need to glue our rug back together again, folks. We need to put the plants back, not just to make biological corridors that allow plants and animals to move back and forth between viable habitats, but to create viable habitats where we've destroyed them, where we live, where we work, where we farm, where we play. If we do this, uh, it'll be the first time in modern history that we actually coexist with nature. Our third misstep was to, to leave Earth stewardship to just a few specialists, a few conservation biologists, few ecologists. For some reason, we did not see it as an inherent responsibility of everybody on the planet, but I don't know why, because everybody on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody bear the responsibility of good Earth stewardship? Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder, uh, once said that the Western settler mindset is, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You were not born with these mindsets, you're taught them. And we've been very good at teaching this one. We've been terrible at teaching our kids and our peers that we all have obligations to good earth stewardship. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. Right now, so many of us feel totally powerless. The earth's problems are huge. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink their lawn. One person can turn out their lights. One person can use keystone plants. One person can get rid of their invasive plants. We didn't talk about that. One person can put in a pollinator garden. One person can totally revitalize their little piece of the earth and then enhance their local ecosystem instead of detract from it. It also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't worry about the entire planet's problems. You get depressed. Just worry about your little piece of the planet that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy. Help a, help a, a park or a preserve. They're all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So as property owners or as volunteers, each one of us has the power, and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is gonna determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own fate. Now, I'm pretty sure I've convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, I have a, a question or a comment I want to make. And then I saw you speak a couple of years ago here in Houston and you had a drawing that showed the, um, like a block, a typical block of houses and they had all um, a connected continuous strip along their backyards of, of native um, whatever, whatever native plants belong in that ecosystem. And that made a, a connected corridor. And I've tried to find that in order to share it to people because I think that's like the most brilliant idea. 
Huh. <laughs> it's not coming to mind right now. I'll think about it. It's probably in an old talk. Um, yeah. It was before your most recent book. Right, right. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll look for it. Okay. So let's see what else we have. Oh, I know what you're talking about. It was, a, yeah, I, I've got it. You want me to send that to you? Yes, please. Well, I will uh, share it. I think send, it's me, send me your, your email and I'll send those to you. Okay. Margaret wanted you to tell us about the benefits of goldenrod. Okay. Uh, goldenrod is the top ranked herbaceous plant over a lot of the country. And in the areas where it's not, uh, native sunflower, perennial sunflowers are. And the benefits are, first of all, goldenrod does not make you sneeze. A lot of people think it does, but it's actually ragweed that makes you sneeze. Goldenrod pollen is very heavy and sticky and it does not float on the air. Um, so goldenrods, uh, it, it supports the most pollinators and it supports the most specialist bees. That's why it's so important. It's also a, a uh, you know, there's a lot of species of goldenrod, but some of them are, are highly competitive. And when you have a serious invasive species problem, like for example, I've got Japanese stilt grass. It is a real problem. And goldenrod is about the only thing that can keep that at bay. Uh, so there's advantages from that as well. And it makes valuable seeds that then help support uh, many of our overwintering birds, particularly sparrows during the winter time. So it has a lot of advantages. Great. So, have you found ways to motivate our local nurseries to supply more native species? You know what? You have found ways to motivate your local nurseries because uh, they're recognizing that it's, it's a business opportunity. As more and more people go and ask for, for natives, uh, if they say, no, I don't have them, they've, they've just lost a sale. Uh, then, and native plant sales are going through the roof all over the country. So the nurserymen are recognizing this is a business opportunity. I used to talk about you know, everybody relandscaping. We got 129 home, million homes in the US. And if everybody relandscaped and, and, and switched out many of their plants, that is not gonna hurt the nursery industry. That's a, a uh, business opportunity. And they're finally figuring, figuring that out. Plus I'm saying, you know, shrink the area of lawn in half, that's a lot more plants. So where are they gonna get them? From the nursery industry. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm sorry, I scrolled down. Someone wanted to know if all oaks are equal or if there's some better ones. Um, obviously we need to have our, our, our local regional versions of oak. But. Right, we have 91 species of oaks in the country and you do wanna use the species that occur where you are. The biggest diversity of oaks is in the Southeast, uh, but Texas has a lot of oaks. Um, there are oaks that do well in the wet, there are oaks that do well in the dry, there are oaks that do well on acidic soil and oaks that do well on basic soil. So you do wanna pick the ones uh, that are appropriate for where you, you live. And that's what I would focus on rather than trying to pick the ones that are gonna support the most insects because they're all really good. Now I did have a student this summer who compared 16 species of oaks and there's a little bit of difference. The white oak uh, was, was number one in, in our area, um, but the differences between them were not huge. The oaks that supported the least were the oaks that were outside of their range. So as soon as you move beyond the animals that are adopted to, adapted to that particular species, uh, they're not gonna use it, of course. Uh, one of the things we did was compare red oak that is planted ornamentally in Portland, Oregon, where it's, you know, what, 2000 miles beyond its natural range with red oaks that uh, grow right here in, in uh, Southeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, and it was night and day. I mean, there were almost almost uh, nothing using the oaks in Portland. And of course, red oaks here are the number two besides white oaks. So they're really, really good. So it, you've got to use oaks that are appropriate for your area. But once you do that, uh, the white oak group has a slight advantage over the red oak group, but not much. And then you've also got the live oak group. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're a little bit lower too because their leaves get so tough as, as they stay on the trees for a long time. But uh, I, I wouldn't worry about that. I would pick the oaks that are gonna do best in your area. And that includes the diseases that we're dealing with. We have introduced a number of serious oak diseases. 
Um, Oak Wilt, for example, is clobbering the white oak group in a lot of places. So where that's true, favor the red oak group. Uh, at my house, I've got bacterial uh, leaf scorch, which is clobbering the red oak group. So uh, I, you know, I'm favoring the white oak group now. So, so, and then of course in California, you've got uh, sudden oak death syndrome. So, so you know, we 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 are challenging our oaks a lot, and what we can do is favor the oaks that already have some resistance to these diseases. Right. Um, someone else commented that in their yard. Um, they don't have room for a big tree, but wanted to know about just keeping small samplings, like I guess planting small ones and keeping them till they're too big. I don't know how that would work. You know, there are uh, a number of species of oaks that are, are quite small. Uh, the dwarf chinkapin oak, the dwarf chestnut oak, there's a dwarf uh, of the southern live oak, believe it or not, dwarf, dwarf, uh, I'm not gonna call it a variety. It's, it's, you know, it's a naturally occurring variant. As you move further west, I'm not sure exactly you know, where it falls out in Texas, but there's a whole string of uh, oaks that are actually shrubs. There's even some oaks that are ground covers. So there are small oaks that uh, you can find uh, that occur in, in your area that are appropriate for any size yard. Not all the oaks are gigantic, but uh, there is the option of, of forming oak coppice, if you know what I mean. You get a, you get a uh, let's say you get a red oak, let it grow up, to four inch diameter and then cut it off at the base and it'll come back looking like a bush. And maybe every 10 years, cut it off again and, and that reestablishes it and forms a, a coppice. People used to coppice uh, several species all the time in the old days to use the, the uh, shrub-like stems that came up. I don't know what they used it for. I've never figured out what they made coppice for, but they did it a lot. And Fences. you can do it too. You can have a, a, a oak shrub by coppicing. I think fences and wattle for building baskets. Okay. Yeah, All right. Kind of Good. Firewood. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, someone is concerned if they get a lot of birds, they'll have fewer butterflies. <laughs> Um, no, they want a fewer butterflies. Butterflies are bad tasting day flying moths. Yeah. And the reason they fly during the day is that most of them don't taste good and, and birds occasionally take them, but not many. Yeah. They do clobber the, the moths. And uh, that could be a valid concern because they eat thousands of them. And I often wonder, you know, I've got, I've got 1,137 species of moths in my yard. None of them are really, really abundant. I don't have any big outbreaks of anything because the birds are eating them all the time. Um, so I thought, well, gee, I could have more moths if I had fewer birds, but that's why I have moths, so I can have a lot of birds. I mean, it's it's part of the picture. These are these are natural controls. Uh, yeah. And even if you if you didn't have birds, there are insect parasitoids that hit these things all the time. So I would just go with, with nature's design, let them determine how many things are gonna be in your yard if you, if you put the appropriate plants that start the whole system going. Yeah, Doreen wants to know if any of your studies have examined the benefits of native bars or cultivars of natives. One of our studies, we did that once, um, looking at six cultivar traits on uh, woody plants. So we did not look at flower traits, but we, we looked at, at Traits like if you take a tall plant and make it short, uh, what happens to the insects on that plant? If you take a green leaf and make it red or purple or variegated, if you introduce disease resistance, if you, if you enhance berry size in the fall or, or in, increase fall color, um, those were the six traits that we looked at. And the only trait that consistently reduced insect use was taking a green leaf and making it red or purple. So I can say uh, with confidence that you should avoid the red cultivars, red leaf cultivars that are so common because they're definitely gonna, gonna wreck the productivity of that, that native. Uh, but I was surprised the other traits didn't seem to matter very much. The news is not so great with um, flowers and so many of our cultivars focus on flowers. Uh, Annie White at the University of Vermont has uh, done some studies. Of course, all that flower specialization, the bee specialization, they're specializing in particular uh, colors of the flowers, the UV spectrum, the nutrition of the pollen, the amount of nectar, 
Uh, all of these things are highly specialized. And when you start changing all that, it messes up that relationship for a lot of, of the bees, not all of them. So for example, there is, there's a cultivar uh, of Phlox paniculatum called Jenna. It was found in Georgia. It was a natural variance found in Georgia and then they you know, cloned it and put it out there. It has twice the number of flowers as the straight species. So yes, it supports twice the number of butterflies. Um, and that's a naturally occurring cultivar. So, so the answer really is it depends on what the genetic trait was, but more times than not, uh, changing a, a flower structure, making it a double flower, for example, um, reduces insect use uh, over the, the straight species. We know the straight species works well. So I would love to see that always offered in the nursery industry. And if you want to buy the cultivar, that, that's up to you. But you ought to have the option of buying the straight species. The thing that I don't like about cultivars the most is that they typically are propagated clonally, which means they have zero genetic variability. And we know with all of the challenges we're, we're, we're you know, challenging our plants with every day, we need as much genetic variability as possible because that is what fuels evolution. That's how the natural selection works. It picks the ones that are going to be able to make it. And if, if all of the plants we put in the landscape have zero genetic variability, not going to work. So um, Courtney says she has room for one more tree and Houston has a lot of oaks. So do you have a second choice for our area? Yeah, second in your area is one of the native prunus. Um, so if it's if it's not a big area, you could you could get Chickasaw plum, um, American plum, um, black cherry, pin cherry uh, are, are very good. So it depends on your your situation, but prunus is is number two. Native willows are number three. Um, your cottonwoods are are uh, very high. Hickories are very high. Those could be big trees. So if you only have room for one tree, you probably want to go with, with one of the smaller ones. And pretty too. And pretty, yeah. Pretty in the spring. Um, okay. I haven't been removing things as I'm answering. So I've got a whole big- I just saw a little chat there. How about pecan trees? Yeah, they're, you know, they're related to black walnuts. Um, and they're, they're also very high. So yeah, that's great. You get the pecans mm -hmm. and good biodiversity out of it. Hmm. So someone uh, mentioned she has a lot of milkweed in this year and she's seen many mar monarchs uh, landing on them but has no caterpillars yet. But she has many wasps but she's worried if that's the reason. That also they shouldn't be laying eggs. They should be heading to Mexico. Yeah, at this point you don't want to see any. Um, I, I, it's hard to believe she didn't have any earlier in the season. Um, wasps do take them. Spiders take them. Ninety percent of the monarch eggs are taken by ants before they even hatch. But those are all normal forms of, of predation. Uh, if you keep up a good population of milkweeds, they will benefit the monarch over, over the years. So uh, some years will be a lot, some years it will be uh, a little bit, but it's hard to believe you didn't have some, some monarch larvae earlier on. You know, another thing that, that uh, you can do to increase monarch use of your, your milkweeds is to cut them back um, early in the season so where, where I live, if I, if I cut some of my milkweeds back in May, mid June, um, then they come up and they have nice fresh foliage in August. And that's when our monarchs are reproducing the, the most up here. Monarchs, everybody say, which milkweed do they like the best? They like all of them, but they like young, fresh foliage. So when common milkweed gets really tough or, or uh, what is it, antelope milkweed, when those things get really tough, the monarchs don't like them very much. So you want, you want fresh foliage. That's what they like the most. Okay. Lynn loves maples. She would like you to talk about acers, particularly acer rubrium. Acer rubrum, red maple. Um, maples are in the top 10. They're great plants. Uh, and there, you know, there's a lot of non-native maples for sale. Stick to the native ones and certainly avoid Norway maple. 
that's the least attractive of any of the maples because it's got a, a sticky latex sap in it, just like milkweeds. And our insects can't handle it. But it's a good plant. Plant it, it's, you know, red maple does well in, in wetter areas. So if you have a wetter area, that's that's a good place to put it. Silver maple does well along rivers. Hmm. Are you familiar with our Texas superstar plant list? I don't think so. Yeah, me, not e me either, other than our hmm. AgriLife extension. They're like Texas strong plants, um, may or may not be native. Sure. <laughs> um, well, we should make a Texas superstar list of all natives. <laughs> yeah, we should. Um, in Texas, oat wilt seems to be attracting, affecting red oaks the most. That's red true. oaks the most. Huh. Okay. In Ohio, it's white oaks. This is another disease. It's one we brought up from Central America, apparently. Um, they, they're causing huge problems. And the, there are two, well, one solution that you hear all the time is, well, don't plant oaks anymore. That is not a solution because we depend on them a lot. And what we need to do is to find the resistant genotypes that can, can survive these diseases. So now is the time to plant more oaks than ever and see which ones die. The ones that die, psh, they're out of there, but the ones that don't, they're gonna be the future. And the Jays will help that because only the oaks that are healthy make the acorns in a year. And those are the ones the Jays will disperse. So they help select for the disease resistant plants. But uh, with all of the diseases we've got around here, plant as many oaks as you can and just see which ones make it. And a lot of times, you know, it's, it's 15, 20 years before they actually get sick. So, um, and if they get sick and die, then you've gotten 15, 20 years worth of use out of them. And you're part of a natural experiment to come up with these resistant genotypes. Well, okay. Just want to answer this for, I think the name is Gracia, perhaps, or Gracia. Uh, she wants to know if there's resources to find um, landscapers that only work with native plants in our area. And our speaker on Thursday is one such landscaper. And yes, we should start maintaining a list as they grow in our area of landscapers that specialize in native plants. Right. We don't have enough of them, but as they as they uh, get trained and, and, and start their own businesses, please support them. Yeah. Everywhere I go, people want to hire these these this <laughs> this non-existent group of, of landscapers. Um, but I think it's a it's a great career for the future. And um, yes, I native plant societies all over the country should be keeping lists of, of uh, people that, uh, you know, uh, everybody can turn to to get responsible landscaping. I don't know what they are for your area, but. Um, Renee, I think wants to know what you think about those Mason bee houses that they um, have become popular recently. Mm -hmm. Are they a good idea? Um, yeah, I like them. It's not just Mason bees. There are a lot of species of native bees that will nest in, in holes in wood. It's one of the reasons that that uh, coarse woody debris in your property is good because the bees will go right in there. Of course, we generally clean up all that stuff. So these bee hotels uh, can can be can be good for a lot of species. The problem is that we keep making them bigger and bigger, and it, we give the bees only one place to nest, and that makes it really easy for diseases and predators to clobber them. So we're putting all our bees in one basket. So I favor having a number of much smaller bee hotels around your property. You always wanna put them in a place where it's dry, where it's not gonna rain on it. Uh, but that spreads reproduction out over, over uh, space. And that then if a predator or a disease finds it, it won't, won't take them all out. Anonymous commented that um, he or she's heard that monarchs lay their eggs north of us. I don't know if they mean on the way back north. Perhaps. Uh, well, could be. Could be they go farther north before they start reproducing. I think you have um, a resident population right along the Gulf Coast. 
that, yeah. that does not migrate. Um, but that is a distinct possibility. They come across the Rio Grande and they head north uh, as fast as they can. So maybe they are not laying their eggs yet. It's a good, good point. Oh, Margaret also commented that silver maples are not good for our area. I guess they were in one of your lists earlier. Oh, and that they don't. <laughs> okay. Margaret is our tree person. Yeah, I don't want to recommend something that doesn't grow in your area. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, cedar elms. I like cedar elms, and they're underappreciated and underutilized in local landscapes. Thoughts? Are they true elms? I don't know. Are they true elms? Off if hand, they I'm are, sure. I like them too. Yeah. <laughs> Someone going to answer that in the comments? I believe they are. Okay. Oh, good. Andrew's, Andrew's back. I think they were in the NIPSA, or in the uh, Native Landscaping Certification Program here, and I think they are homeless. Yeah. I should, I need to get out my notes and review them more often. Any specific area place to find which insect species are found on which plants? That's what's on that native plant finder with the National Wildlife Federation website. And not only tells you how many insects are in various plant genera, but it'll tell you which ones. Yeah. And not, not insects, they're caterpillars. Um, so they're also putting up a, another website. I think it's called, um, uh, what's it called? Plants for Wildlife, something like that. And it includes the plants for, for specialist bees in various eco regions. Uh, so that, that will be the future of that website is, as soon as we get it a little cleaned up. Lori wants your opinion on native grasses. They're great. Yeah, she has uh, there are a lot of species. things that depend on grasses. Uh, native grasses, of course, are where the grassland birds bred all the time. The grassland birds breed on the ground. They nest on the ground. And uh, most of our native grasses are bunch grasses and the birds run in between the bunches. Uh, they don't land near their nest. They land far from the nest and then run up to it so that the predators can't see where the nest really is. Uh, there are a lot of, um, all the skippers, not all the skippers, most of the skippers uh, depend on, on uh, grasses. And most of the satirid butterflies are grass specialists. Uh, and then, of course, we've got grasshoppers and all the other things that, that uh, not just eat grass, but they eat forbs in, in our meadows. Uh, but they depend a lot on our, our native, native grasses. So they're extremely important. There's a lot of species of them. Uh, and they've been challenged because uh, we brought in particularly grasses from Africa for a lot of our uh, cattle ranches. I mean, we, we brought it in for, for cattle and things like cheatgrass. Uh, you know, they've spread far and wide, hundreds of thousands of square miles in the West covered with cheatgrass now, which burns very frequently. A lot of our fire problems, you never hear about this, but the fires start outside of the forest in cheatgrass and then run into the forest and cause all kinds of huge problems. Um, and that is not a native grass. So native grasses uh, are, are um, they are definitely the way to go if you have the option. <clears throat> Um, Anne wants to know how you rate our, our Texas pine trees. Pines are, are ranked very high, uh, typically higher than, than maples for somebody who wanted to, to know earlier. I don't know, about, this, about the same, but in the, in the top 10, a lot of things are, are pine specialists. Uh, appropriately planted, you know, they're coastal plain. Uh, uh, well, they're all over the place. Other species are in the mountains. Texans don't have a whole lot of mountains, do you? But the dry, dry, uh, higher mountains in the West uh, certainly have uh, a lot of pines. Yeah, we have a good plants. We have a big, thick, piney woods in East Texas. In East Texas, um, yeah. Are we running out of time? It is eight after eight thirty. So I can take a few more if you have them. Okay. Let's see. Well, okay, someone wants to know about changing the water in the mosquito buckets. Should that be, that be done? Um, 
you know, the, the, the dunk gets used up. Yeah. Uh, and at that point, I would start uh, again. But you're, you're talking about that's measured in weeks. I mean, some people have said, well, why don't you just dump out the bucket? And that kills all the mosquito larvae. And you can do that. Uh, but then you have to start from scratch with new new water and new new hay and straw. And, um, but yeah, I would change it. I would change it once in a while. I have noticed uh, with my mosquito dunk that it gets cloudy. Uh, so it works real well, but it gets cloudy and that that may not be as attractive after a while. I'm just not sure. So yeah, once in a while, dunk, uh, dump it out and start again. But maybe, you know, maybe once every three weeks. Lots more comments about oaks. Cedar elm is native, which I did know that. I just did not know if it was true elm, which was the question. Um, yeah, and lace bark elm, that's a popular tree here, is not native. It's from China. Mm. Um, yeah, here's something I wondered too, because it's a permaculture thing to have what they call guilds of plants that like to be together. Um, someone wants to know about finding information that natives that like to be together. Yeah, that's uh, somebody was just talking about how we need we need books on it. There are plant communities that like mm -hmm. to be together, a number of species all over the country, and they vary a lot as you move around from soil type and altitude. Um, so there are definitely plants that we call them associations. Uh, most good uh, plant. Uh, um, well, certainly plant ecology text, but uh, good restoration books always talk about plant as associations. So yes, they exist, and, and those plants definitely do like to be together. Uh, it doesn't mean that other plants won't grow with these plants. It, it, what it means is that the requirements of these the plants in these communities are all very similar. So they like the same soil type, the same rainfall type. Um, so you, you hear like oak hickory forest or your piney woods. I mean, they're gonna have a very distinct uh, community of, of trees and shrubs. Well, speaking of shrubs, Elizabeth wants to know about the best shrubs for uh, caterpillars. Uh, the, you know, we just don't have as many shrubs uh, in North America as, as people think. Um, viburnums uh, always always rank very high, about uh, about 120 species on viburnum. Um, but a lot of our shrubs, things like witch hazel, not so high. Uh, our ilex, uh, we've got a number of species of ilex, and there are a number of specialists on ilex. But when you add them all up, it's not a huge huge number. Ilex, by the way, are really good plants for pollinators. They have tiny little Ilex are, are, are various hollies, particular deciduous, deciduous hollies. They've got tiny little inconspicuous flowers, but boy, when they are in bloom, it, the bees are all over them. So they're very attractive to our, our native bees. Um, Itea is, is uh, it's a you know, wonderful flowering plant and the butterflies come all the time, but it doesn't support any caterpillars. Our button bush, uh, is another wonderful uh, pollinator plant. A few things eat it, but not much. Our, our clethra uh, is good in, in uh, wet situations, uh, but again, not much, not much eats it. So I guess if I had to rank all the shrubs, I would say that, that uh, viburnum is number one. But keep in mind, uh, in, a, in a healthy forest situation, much of the understory are really young, overstory trees. They're young canopy trees that are just waiting for their, their uh, time to come when a, a light gap opens up. So small oaks and small cherries and small willows, all those things are really good, even when they're small. So. Wow. Okay, Lucy comments that the Houston U U.S. Forest Service has data sheets on plant communities. Okay. For great. different trees. That's a place to look. And then Anonymous is worried about the BT in the water, if it kills caterpillars, and should we be careful about where you empty it? No, um, there's you know there's a lot of formulations of BT, and the one you're putting in the water is formulated only for aquatic diptera. Uh, so that's not the one that will kill caterpillars. The one that kills caterpillars will not kill the aquatic diptera. There's one that kills beetles. So there's a lot of different uh, variations of Bacillus thuringiensis. Okay. 
as far as shrubs, uh, Rosario recommended wax myrtle, which could be a small tree or a shrub here in our area. Okay. Okay. Um, are we going to keep going a little? Uh, one more. I got to okay. go to bed. <laughs> I see a lot of actual suggestions. Oh, what causes oak galls? Sinipid gall wasp. It's a whole family of galls. There are yeah. 5,000 species of sinipid gall wasp in the world. And uh, yeah, a lot of them uh, in this country. A single oak can have 70 species of sinipid gallers on it. So uh, it's a type of, type of uh, wasp. Um, it doesn't sting you. It's a little teeny thing. And it lays an egg in the bud of an oak tree. And that grows into a gall. And then the wasp lives inside the gall. Okay, cat is begging. So um, she's concerned about cemetery ferns on her uh, mature oak branches and wants to know if they're a problem. She's concerned about the weight. Or if uh, it's an epiphyte. Headed. It's an epiphyte. Yeah. I, okay. I would say no, it's not a problem. Okay. But, I mean, we don't have them up here. I don't have any real experience with them, but I don't think so. Okay. All right. I think we need to call it a night. Okay. Well, it's been fun. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Good luck, everybody. A lot of thank yous in the comments. So. Okay. Thank you. Take care. All right. So everybody use the same link to come back Thursday. So we'll see you then. Want to uh, highlight that most of the, uh, Three of the talks will be recorded, but Glenn Olson has requested that his not be recorded. So this Thursday's talk will, will not be recorded. But tonight's will. Yeah. Thank okay. you for coming, everyone. We really appreciate it, and we hope to see you Thursday. Good night. <laughs>